Matthew chapter 20 in your Bibles. <clears throat> Go ahead and stand if you would. We'll read our text starting in verse number 1. Matthew chapter number 20, and we'll start with verse number 1. The Bible says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, who went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour, and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out the sixth and ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out, and found others standing idle. And saith unto them, Why stand ye here idle all the day? And they say unto him, Because, we have, because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of that vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came, they, uh, and when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should receive more. And likewise, they received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying, These that have wrought but one hour, these have, excuse me, these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. Let's pray. Father, we ask you this morning to open up this passage of Scripture to us. I pray, Father, that you'd uh, be with my mind and be with my mouth as I preach the message. Lord, I've studied the chapter, I've laid it out, I've tried to seek it out and set it in order. And Lord, if you get in it, then it'll be a message to the hearts of the people that want to hear. And if you don't, Lord, it'll just be a, a waste of our time. It'll be idle. And Father, I don't want to be idle this morning. I want to be busy doing your work, and I want you to use me. So I pray that you would, God. And I pray you'd give every person in this room something that will help them out, that'll encourage them, maybe motivate them, maybe convict them. Whatever it is each individual heart and soul needs today, God, I pray you'd please give it to them. And I ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his honor and glory we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to take my thought this morning from verse number 6. If you'll look at that, it says, In about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? What I want to preach to you on this morning is idle Christianity, or why stand idle? You realize that it's in our nature for us to be a little lazy. It's in our nature for us to kind of kick things into neutral and just take the easy road. I heard a great saying this week that I'm going to try to remember, I'm going to try to steal it. It says, take the high road, it's less crowded. That's a good say, statement because honestly, most people just go with the low, the easy road. My dad used to say this to me and he drilled it into my head when I was young. He said, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. Yeah. Boy, that's true. You sit around and kick your mind in neutral and you'll be shocked at the little demons that start playing in your head after a little while. I'll add one to that and this is just my own thought, but idle feet and idle hands are the flesh's workshop. When you're bored, when you're idle, when you're not doing anything, you wind up getting into trouble, period, the end of the discussion. Because in your nature, there is sin. In these hands, naturally, in these feet, naturally, in this flesh, naturally, in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So when we're idle, we tend to just hit the low road and stay on the low road. You'll notice it, parents, with your kids. It just comes natural for your children. They want to be lazy. Come on, I thought I'd get a little more of an amen than that. <laughs> Naturally, they want to just gravitate to sleeping in. Naturally, they want to gravitate to not cleaning their room. Naturally, they want to gravitate to video games or to television or just to, to loafing around because in all of us, there's just a desire always to make me happy. 
And listen, making me happy is putting my feet up with nothing to do and finding a way to just enjoy the moment, right? Just kick it into neutral. Well, that's really a bad place to be. I could preach all day long on being idle in the flesh. I could preach all day long about children. I mean, with our kids when they're home on breaks, we find it very helpful to the entire family to put us on a schedule. This doesn't mean we don't give everybody a day off and like today is a chill day, we'll lay around and watch TV. That does happen, okay? But the overall well-being of the household, it's shocking to Grace and I. We learned this years ago. When they have chore lists to do and a schedule to keep, they're happier when we get home. It's shocking. But you know what? Even though you know you'll be happier doing what you need to do, even though you know you'll be happier saying, here's some goals I should achieve, here's some things I should do, and when you set those goals and achieve those goals or fail trying, you always find you're a happier individual. You still knowing that at 40-something years old, preaching to myself, knowing that about yourself, I will still tend, if I'm not careful, to gravitate to idleness. To realize that before I know it, I wasted the entire day. That's true on the job. Employees just tend to be idle, right? I mean, naturally, if you can make money and not have to do anything, that's exactly what you're going to do. Didn't we learn that this year? That's going to happen. That is human nature. Well, those stinking lazy people, stop for a minute. If you enable them to be lazy, you're just as much to blame as they are. Because you played right into what we know the flesh is going to do. It's natural. You should have to work in order to eat. There should be a cause and effect. Because what will happen is when you get hungry enough, you'll go to work. Because you want to eat. But naturally, we gravitate to that lazy point. Naturally, we want to just loaf around. Naturally, we want to gravitate to what is easiest. And spiritually speaking, which is more important than preaching at you about having a work ethic. Because today we're here to talk about the spiritual, right? Amen. Spiritually speaking, we tend to be the laziest. It is so hard to be a hard worker spiritually, to be dedicated to getting the job done spiritually, when you don't really, oftentimes, you don't really see much immediately in return for what you're doing. I'll just be honest. You'll, you'll come to church and you'll sit there and not every Sunday you're going to be like, that was the best message I ever heard. It's literally not possible. It's not possible for me every week to be like, that was pastor's personal best. We're going to set a new personal record every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday. As much as we have to do this, you know, a lot of it is just literally, it's, it's just mundane. It's just routine. It's just drag. It's just, you show up and you're investing spiritually into your spiritual well-being. You're asking God to do something for you. And not every time is there necessarily something that's just life-changing. Wasn't that wonderful? So it's so easy. To just go, you know what, if I'm not getting much of a feedback, I'm not going to do anything. Not every time when you get up in the morning and open up your Bible to do your devotions is something wonderful going to jump out in the scriptures at you. and just, I never saw that before. Isn't that amazing? That just changed my life. There's the key to success. It was all unlocked and now I have my best life now. I walked out in the driveway and there was a Maserati. I mean, it's like, wow, that's a God thing, man. Sometimes you just read your Bible and guess what? You did it because it's the right thing to do because you're laboring and you're working in the field and you're trying to please God and you're investing in spiritual things and you don't feel like you're getting much back for it. You know, sometimes you give and you don't feel like you get much in return. I would love to promise to you that if you come up here and lay $100 on the altar and I step on it and say a prayer over it and we do a little bit of untie a bow tie on it, you're going to go leave and $1,000 is going to show up in your bank account. That might be the IRS, but that wasn't God or because you put $100 down here. Sometimes you give and as a result of your giving, you, you can't do other things that you wanted to do and you say, well, I mean, what's the point? Sometimes you pray and God says no in answer to prayer. God doesn't answer prayers. I'm going to quit praying. God always answers prayers. I have never prayed a prayer and not gotten an answer. Sometimes I get the answer I want. And usually when we say God answers prayer, that's what we mean by it. When I prayed God gave me what I want, 
praise God he answers prayer. You know, I prayed a lot of prayers and God said no. Did God answer? You know, other prayers that I prayed, God said wait. Man, I don't like that one. When he says no, I can pout, get mad, throw a fit, take a grudge, whatever, and then get over it and move on with my life. You know what I mean? Because I accept the no eventually. But when he says wait, he's stringing me along. <laughs> and I've had God say wait to me. I have prayed for a million dollars. I know the preachers are always all about the money. Relax, please. I prayed for it. Why not? Why wouldn't you? I mean, honestly, can God answer prayers? Is God a miracle working God? Okay, so is there a million dollars out there somewhere? Does somebody else have it? Wouldn't you ask him for it? I mean, why wouldn't you ask him for it? I promise I'll tithe. I promise, I promise, I promise. I've tried it all. God, if you give me a million dollars, I'll pay off the house. I'll pay off any other random debts. And then I will pay for the church to put on the addition. Just that's it. I mean, I won't even save any. I'll just give it all away after I pay off my own debts. You know, all the other <laughs> nice paid for house, all the rest of that stuff. <coughs> Might work out an upgrade in the house paid off. And anyways, I prayed for it. God said no. That's an answer to prayer. You know, just because God doesn't always answer the prayers the way I want them answered doesn't mean I quit praying. You know, sometimes I pray and it's just honestly a little bit of a drag. I don't feel a, much of a spark in it. There are times it's not a drag at all. I'll be honest with you. Man, there are times when I get down and pray and I just feel like, man, this is, this is good. But I will be honest, I'm 100% out there with you. Not as spiritual as you think I am. That is very rare. Most of the time I pray because I'm making myself do something I don't naturally want to do because naturally I would rather be spiritually idle than actually getting to work for God. How about witnessing? You know how many people witness for years with no result? It's so easy just to go into idle. Now, I-D-L-E, right? Not I-D-O-L, I-D-L-E. To go into idle with your witness spiritually. Because you'll try and then you think something's going to happen and nothing happens and, and you just give up. In verse number 6, the Lord, the, the good men of the house, who obviously is a type of the Lord in the passage, he comes along and he says, Why stand ye here idle, all the day idle? Why aren't you doing something? Why aren't you busy? Why aren't you working? It's a great question. Why do people just lack an interest in their walk, and their personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Why is it that nowadays the things of God almost mean nothing to people? When you say, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And I'm not talking to people that don't know the gospel, don't know the Lord, and have never been saved. I'm talking about saved people this morning. Why is it that saved people don't seem to care at all about whether or not they're doing anything for the Lord Jesus Christ with their life? It's like, hey, doing something for God with your life, that's for the preacher. That's for the missionary. That's for the deacon. That's not for the average Joe. I'm just, you know, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I believe. Why is it that so many people don't care at all about serving God or getting involved in the service of God or doing something for Jesus Christ? Now, there's a lot of things I could dive into because, uh, man, I've been learning some things myself and listening to some things, and there's a lot of reasons why nowadays Christians are so starving, so starved, spiritually speaking. That They were given the wrong message for so many years. The wrong message started a little over 70 years ago in, in mass, in force. And we preach the wrong message all the time and then not seeing those things actually happen, people have begun to think God's not real and the Bible's not real. That's why when we preach, we preach through the Bible. And I tell you the honest truth, in the world you shall have tribulations. There you go. Still want to serve the Lord? <laughs> you give, you'll be poorer, that's that. Still want to serve the Lord? You witness, you'll get mocked and made fun of. People will mock you and make fun of you. You still want to witness? I just give you the bad news first. And if you say, you know what, if that's what it means to serve the Lord, I love him and I want to serve him anyhow, then from there, good things wind up happening. But why not just preach the truth to people? Why not lay it out, it is what it is, like it is. Hey, listen, get involved in serving God with no promise at all of God doing anything special for you. Just get involved because you love him, because you want to serve him, because he's a good God, because it's the only way to go in life. There's no other way to go. Why not? Yes, serve the Lord because you want to serve him. 
not for what the whiff of what's in it for me. In this passage, we see three different things that I want to point out about why people stand idle. The first reason I think we stand idle so often spiritually is because of the conceit of selfishness. Look at verse number three. He went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. So there's people here at the beginning. He goes in the morning in verses one and two. In the morning, he gets out there first thing and he says, hey, guys, who wants to work, right? And a whole bunch of them, they're like, yeah, we'll work. He says, here's the deal. If you come to work for me, you get a penny. They say, okay, sounds good. That's fair. Now, in that economy, that would have been fair. That's a fair price. No deal. No, no problem. Let's go to work. They get out there first thing in the morning and they're working. Then the third hour, he goes out and he's like, man, I got a lot more work that needs to get done. I got a very small workforce and I got a bunch of work that needs to be done. Let me go out here into the, into the market and see. And he goes into the market and there's all these people standing around. He's like, hey guys, it's the third hour of the day. The morning's half over. You guys want to go to work? Oh yeah, we'll go to work. Okay, at the end of the day, I'll pay you what it's worth. Notice when these people, he says, go ye, verse 4, go ye also to the vineyard. Whatsoever's right, I'll give you. They went. Verse number five, he goes out the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. Hour six, he goes out, half day's half over. Hey guys, you want to work? I still got work that needs to get done. You're standing around idle, but I got work I need to get done. Will you jump on board? Sure, whatever's fair, I'll pay you. Ninth hour, listen, the day's three quarters over. Hey, why are you guys standing idle? I don't know. You want to work? Yeah, we'll work. Go out. Whatever's fair, I'll pay you. Here's the best part. In the 11th hour, verse 6, he goes out and finds other standing idle. And at the 11th hour, the day is almost over. One hour left to work. He goes out and he says, hey guys, why are you standing idle all day? They said, nobody's hired us. Hey, you guys want to work? Yeah, I, I got an hour left to get some stuff done. And in this last hour, in this last hour, I want to accomplish some things that I'm not going to be able to accomplish if you don't get on board in the last hour. In the last hour, will you please get on board? They said, yes, we'll get on board. He said, whatever's fair, I'll pay you. In the last hour of the day, they can't possibly learn and become as good at working as the people that have been there all along working from the very beginning, can they? No. Not jumping in at the last minute. You can't walk in and step into something I've been doing for years and think that somehow or another you're going to have all the answers and know how to do it, understand all the ins and outs and the whys and wherefores. And it's just not possible, right? right? But at the last hour, the good man of the house goes and he says, Hey, listen, I still want to accomplish some things before the sun sets. I still got some things I want to get done. I know you guys aren't the most skilled. I know you're not the most experienced. I know you're not the greatest. And I know most people would never hire you, but will you get to work? And he said, yeah, we'll get to work. I'll pay you what's fair. Now, they haven't been working all of this time because of the conceit of their own selfishness. Because of the idleness of their flesh. They'd rather not do the work. In verse number 7, they miss the point. You notice the, their, their flesh is idle. They're standing around in the marketplace. They're chitting and they're chatting and they're talking and there's all this stuff in the marketplace, but they got no money to buy anything. You understand how dumb that is? You're in the marketplace. You're being marketed. Your flesh is going, ooh, ah, ah, ooh, I really want that. Look at that. I would like that. I'd like that. Well, if you'd like to have it, you need to go get to work. Amen. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, if I want to buy things, I need money to do so. And if I'm going to get money, I need to work, right? Sure. But they're standing in the marketplace like, why? Because it's just easier just to be lazy. That's why. It's more fun. Those guys out there sweating, they're dirty, they stink, they're nasty, they're tired, they're hungry. Why should I do? They're sunburnt. 
Work looks uncomfortable. I don't want to do that when I can stand around here and just chill out with the boys. It's all good. The conceit of selfishness. Your flesh will lie to you. Your flesh will deceive you. Your flesh will hold you back. And then when the good man comes and says, what are you doing? Then they blame it on him. Well, nobody's hired us. You know what? If you want a job, you got to go find one. That's good preaching. That's a, like, like my preacher says, there's an entire book in the Bible on it called J-O-B. Get one. <laughs> that's, that's, that's good preaching. Just get to work. Well, you know, I'm super intelligent and I got all kinds of degrees. And I, you're not working. Well, all that's available is flipping burgers. Then flip burgers. But I'm too educated. They won't hire me because I'm too educated. Is that what they told you? I, I, I just want to know, is that what they told you? Today, with a shortage of workers, is that what they said? You're too educated? You're too proud? You're stuck in the rut of of self-indulgence and self-enjoyment, and whatever's the easiest for me, that's what I'm going to do, and that's why you're not working. Now, we'd all say amen to that in our modern economy, the modern workforce, and all the problems going on that you've seen on the news, but what about spiritually speaking? Why are you standing idle all day? Well, you know, I mean, the Lord just hasn't called me to. I've told you before, I've heard people in their 70s say, as soon as God shows me what he wants me to do with my life, I'm going to do it. Hey, bro, it's a little bit late. I said a little bit late. I didn't say too late. I said it's a little bit late. The conceit of selfishness will keep us from actually getting busy for God. It'll lock us into that idle state. Without realizing it, we've been deceived by our own flesh and our own motives and our own desires to indulge ourselves rather than get to work doing something for God. You know why most marriages get worse with time? It's the conceit of selfishness. It is easier to kick it into neutral and blame it on the other person than it is to look at yourself and say, where can I change, God? What can I improve? What can I do to be better? You realize if you change, improve, and get better, that does not mean your spouse necessarily will. It does not mean you won't wind up in divorce court someday. You know what it does mean? You weren't idle. You did hear what I said, right? It doesn't mean that the marriage is going to fix itself. You can't control the other person. You know what you can control? You. The conceit of selfishness will lock us into an idle state where before long we can't even get up and get going. The intolerance of self-righteousness is part of selfishness. So you've got the idle people that aren't doing anything, right? They're the ones that are there and they're standing in the market and they just come up with dumb excuses and they have no direction and none of it makes any sense. And there's plenty to do. But they didn't go like, hey, look, at oh, When they saw the field, they didn't say, oh, look, he's only got 25 people out there, and they still got an acre and a half to cover. I wonder if he'd hire me. Hey, hey, excuse me, sir, sir, can I, can I work? No, they're standing in the market waiting for him to come to them, and he does, and they get in, right? So there's, there's that selfishness, that laziness, that flesh that just causes you just to settle to the bottom, take the easy road, and just gel out there because that's where you'd rather be, right? And it lies to you. It deceives you. You're tricked and boxed in by it. But then on the other side of the same problem, the conceit of selfishness, on the other side of the same problem, you got people that are actively working. They're in the fields. They're in verses 8 through 15. They've been trying all day. And what happens is he hires new people that come along, and they come along late. And the people that have been there all day, they get very upset with the good men of the house. Look at verse 8. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. So the guy that got in at the 11th hour, I want to see him first. He's coming up first. Okay? Okay. No problem. When they were come, uh, and when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. What in the world? He promised us who got there in the morning that we were going to get a penny. 
And I'm standing back in the back of the line. I've been out here working all day, man. These guys just showed up. I've been out here all day long. But he calls them up first, and I'm standing in the back, and I'm going, oh, they got a penny. Good. Oh, that's good, because that's what he promised me all day. He must be really happy with me, because I started early, and I've been working all day long. And, man, I, I'm really doing a good job. I mean, I stayed through the burden and the heat of the day, and I've been laboring all this time while they were loafing around, and I got in early, and I've given so much to this company, and I've invested so much to help this. You ever hear people get fired, and that's what they say? I've done so much for this company. Quick time out. I, I can get your point, but quick time out. You did nothing for that company. You did it for yourself. Yes. Somebody that might be able to say that may be like the guy who started the business because he loved what he did and wanted to do it and wanted to be his own boss. And, and sometimes that's motivated, not always, but sometimes that's motivated by I don't want to answer to anybody else. Right. Mm -hmm. So really, you're not doing anything for the company. You're doing it for yourself. Let's just face it. I've done so much for this company, and I, I, I just can't believe they treat me like that. Like, uh, uh, what did you expect they'd do? It's about money. I tell my kids early, right, already when we're talking about work, just like, don't you ever forget your job, a job, a corporation does not have a soul. I learned that years ago. I'm sitting there in sales. It is a month before Christmas, and he said, you better hit your numbers. I said, man, I've been like number one two or three months this year in the top ten all year. And you're telling me I better hit my numbers right before Christmas? He said, I'm just telling you, the big guys are coming in and they're evaluating. They're going to be chopping heads. And I'm like, are you threatening me? No, I'm just telling you. He, I know now he's trying to motivate me. I wasn't going to get fired, but at that moment I didn't realize that. Right. And I remember looking at him and saying, you're telling me right before Christmas with little kids at home and a wife, that you're going to fire me if I don't hit my numbers, in spite of the fact that I'm like 200% a quota for the year. He's like, a corporation doesn't have a soul. In other words, we don't care about your wife and kids. That ain't your problem. Bring the money in. And I remember sitting back in my chair, and it hit me for the first time ever in my life. I should have known it before then. I was in my 20s, but I remember sitting back in my chair going, I get it. I get it. You know, you start thinking, I'm 200% a quota for the year. Because you think you're so, you're not that important. <laughs> I'm not expensive. What would they do without me? Same thing they did years before you ever showed up. Same thing they did when CEOs that had a bigger impact on the company than you quit. Or got hired out somewhere else. I'm just trying to say, to remind us just the conceit of selfishness, right? We're yet not usually as important as we think we are. Now, you're important to the Lord, so just hang on a second. We're, we're getting there, okay? Stay with me. Don't write me off yet. We'll hear the whole message and then write me off. By the way, can I just say while well, the thought's in my mind, if you take my messages and edit them, you can make me say anything you want me to say. You've got to hear the whole thing through, and you've got to come back, and you've got to listen to more than one to get the big picture, because you don't want me to preach for eight hours every time I preach. If you want me to preach for eight hours straight, then I'll try to get the whole thing perfectly balanced and not ever be misunderstood. I think we're good with the hour that I do, right? Get, give me an amen on that one. I can do it. They're standing in line and they're seeing the first guy gets a penny. And they're thinking, man, when it comes my turn, he's going to pay me big. The conceit of self-righteousness. And you get all the way to the end there and he says, here's your penny. And they said, are you kidding me? You paid them a penny? When he came in at the last hour, he came in at the ninth hour, he came in at the sixth hour, he came in at the third hour, and I started from the beginning? And you didn't pay me more? You know what happens to this guy? He worked all day long, but because of his self-righteous spirit, because at... The ninth hour, at the, at the third hour, when he's been out there for three hours already, and he's starting to wear down just a little bit, and new guys come on board. How much is he paying you? He didn't say. He just said he's going to be fair. Oh, okay. Well, I know what fair is. Somebody comes at the sixth hour. I'm tired, man. I'm wore out. All the glycogen's gone in my muscles. I need to eat a little something for lunch. Whew. This guy comes in fresh. What you been doing? Oh, hanging out with the boys. Really? I've been out here working for half a day. 
what's he paying you? Don't ever tell anybody what you make. <laughs> Keep that to yourself. Yes, sir. What's he paying you? He said he's going to be fair. Okay. Go on three, another quarter of the day. Now we're to the ninth hour. Somebody else comes in. Whew, man, I'm exhausted. I'm dirty. Wore out, thirsty, hungry. Could use a break. What's he paying you? He just said he's going to be fair. The 11th hour. The 11th hour. You know what we've been through? You know how much work I've put in? You know how much I've sacrificed? You know how hard this has been? You know how much I've learned? You know how many times I've bounced off the bottom and built back again? The 11th hour. What's he paying you? He said he's going to be fair. Now he's standing in the back of the line when it comes payment day, and he's going, man, he's going to lay it on me big. And then he gives me the same thing he gave that guy that came in at the last minute. You know, that guy worked. He wasn't idle, but actually he was idle. Now think about that for a minute. He wasn't idle. He was working. But he was idle because everything he was doing, he'd been doing with the wrong motive for the wrong reason. And he realized when it came judgment day, when it came the time for him to be rewarded for his labors, that he got nothing. Nothing more than the other guy got. Why? Because the conceit of self-righteousness. You know what happens so often in church? We start thinking we're doing so much for God and we've been here so long and we've been so faithful that we're really going to get it laid on us when we get to the judgment seat of Christ. Can I just say for a quick minute, getting in early like some of these kids are, like thank God my wife and I were able to and a few others in the room were able to get in early, you know what that is? That's a tremendous blessing. I mean, man, the earlier you get in to serve the Lord, the earlier you get busy working in that field, the sooner in life you get in your Bible, the sooner in life you get on your knees and pray, the sooner in life you learn who the Lord Jesus Christ is and walk with Him and learn to pray to Him and learn to see Him work and hear His voice and witness for Him and do right. The earlier in life you do it, the better life you'll have. It's a great thing to get in early. I recommend it to everybody. Get in now. But just because you got in early doesn't mean you're more important or you're going to be more rewarded than the people that get in at the last minute. Well, that's not fair. Then why should I work? You're idle. Why should, I be, why should I serve the Lord if I'm going to get to the judgment seat and he might reward somebody that got saved at 50 or 60 years old and just gives the last little bit of their life to God after they got to live their life and they got to party and they got to do all those things and I always tried to do right and you're idle. What do you mean I'm idle? I'm serving the Lord and I'm, I'm in church and I'm on the cleaning crew and I'm, I'm witnessing. And what do you mean I'm idle? You're idle. You're missing the whole point. You're not doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit of God with the joy of God in your heart and in your life. You're not serving Him because you love Him. You're serving Him because what you think you're going to get out of serving Him. It's like, I want to do right because I don't want to suffer in life. That's the wrong, that is idle Christianity. That is not the purpose for serving God. And I'm glad this morning I can recommend to you to get in early and stay in your whole life and don't ever get out. The only regret you'll have is if you get out. But, we got a church full of people that I like to call the 11th hours. We got a church full of people that I like to call the 6th hours. I mean, if you're 40 years old, nothing personal, and you're just getting in, that's halfway through, right? If you're going to be 80, guess what? Better late than never. According to the good man of this house, if you get in and get in the right way, with the right heart, you can come in at the 11th hour. You can, you can get saved at 70 years old. You can waste your entire life living for the flesh, living for the world, living for the devil, putting yourself first. And hey, if you get in at the 11th hour and you get in like you mean it and you serve your Savior, he'll reward you like somebody that got saved at five and pastored a church for 50 years if you do it the right way. Yes, sir. How could that be? Because he's a good man. Can I say this? There is so much blessing, so much reward, so much joy 
in serving in that field. I feel like God's already paid so much forward. If I got to the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and he goes, here's your little tiny brick of gold and here's a little bit of silver and here's a couple. I mean, man, I can't believe you're doing all that for me. Well, I thought you'd have a great big pile. Well, you're on crack. You don't know me like I know me. He's paid me so much already. And just serving the Lord, it's a blessing, man. And just having a, that, that, that clean conscience between you and the Holy Spirit of God and trying to keep it clean. I'm, don't, don't get the wrong impression. I'm not trying to be like, you know, I walk on water. I wish I could take a bath, but I can't because I just float on top. You know, no, none of that kind of stuff. But I'm saying, listen, man, in serving God and trying to give your life to Him, there is so much already paid forward. I can't believe that He promises us at the end of the day that He's even going to pay us. It's just been an honor to be in the field. Thank you for, hey, you owe it to them that lived a whole life for the devil and didn't know the truth and didn't have the chances I had. Hey, God, lay it on them in heaven. Give it to them big. Amen. You've already done so much for me. I, I don't want to be idle. And I don't want to think that because I'm Mr. Goody Goody and I'm a pastor and I read my Bible and I pray and I try to witness that that somehow means I should get paid more than some of you that got saved at 50, 60, 70 years old. And said, man, I really want to get certain victories in my life. But you know, at this point, I don't think I'm ever going to quit smoking. But I'm trying. I'm in church. I didn't go to church my whole... This is a new thing for me. I didn't raise my family this way. This is a new thing for me. And I, you know, I'm beating myself up because I should have done this earlier. Well, that text says if you do it right at the 11th hour, he's going to reward you like somebody has been there from the beginning. Amen. So what I'm trying to say this morning is just get in. Just don't be idle. Don't put it off another day. It doesn't matter what's in the past. Get in now. Why stand idle? Why let the clock run up? Get in late, but don't get in never. Is that encouraging, even though I'm yelling at you? Sorry about the shower. <laughs> you thought I didn't see it, but I did. Number two, let me move on so I can get you out of here. Another thing that will keep you idle in serving the Lord is the competition that comes with self-promotion. Look down in the text at verse number 20. And they came, then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons. And she's doing the right thing, isn't she? What's she doing? She's worshiping him. Is she doing the right thing? For the wrong reason. Look at the text. And desiring a certain thing of him. He said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy kingdom. You know what she's wanting? She's wanting some self-promotion. You know how many people come to the Lord and worship Him? But they do it with that competitive spirit. You know what you have all the time in church? All the time. Because you have human beings in church. You have a competitive spirit. You know this... How come we can get here early and they're always late? Well, my question is, why would you even ask that question? What do you care? You know why I try to be early? Because I want to be early. If the pastor is standing back there, hey, man, good to see you. Thanks for coming. Glad you're here. And they're like, sorry, I'm late. I'm like, better late than never. Glad you're here. Don't worry about it. Grab a seat. If that's the pastor's attitude, then why should it bother anybody else? If it's going to get under anybody's skin, it would be mine, right? I'm not saying be late. I'm saying it ain't really an issue. It doesn't really matter who's doing what, what they're doing, and how they're doing it, and when they're doing it, and where they're doing it, why they're doing it, and I don't like them, and I don't think I don't like I don't like their spirit, and I don't think they're right, and I told them about that guy ain't right. Else. What are you insinuating? You know, character assassination is murder. There's certain things if I could convince you about a man, I think that man's a fill in the blank. I basically just ended his life. competition, that competitive spirit. Folks, that ought not be in church. But boy, we get it. Why? We're human. And if you're serving God out of competitive reasons like this woman, you're idle. What do you mean? I'm worshiping. Yeah, you're like, your car's in neutral. And you're vroom, 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 vroom. You're making a bunch of noise, but you're not going anywhere. Why? Because your motive is to promote yourself in church. You know, a lot of people serve God for what it's going to do for them. I already mentioned that earlier in the message. That's, that's, that's idle. 
This woman, she's not trying necessarily to promote herself personally because she's humble enough to realize, you know what, I, I, I don't got it. You know the it factor. Some people just don't got it, right? Yeah. But that doesn't make them any less competitive. You know what she does? She finds another way to compete through her sons. She's living vicariously through the boys. So when she comes to the Lord worshiping, he looks at her and says, what do you want? Hey, I got a whole list of things you could have asked the Lord. Hey, Lord, would you give me wisdom when I open my Bible? I want to see stuff in that book that you're showing me. Uh, Lord, would you help me to be able to reach people? I'd like to be able to help people. I'd like to be a better witness. Uh, Lord, you know what I'd like? I'd like to learn how to pray. I'd like to know what it means to be a, somebody who truly prays, who gets a hold of you. Uh, Lord, you know what I'd like? I'd like, just, I'd like to have a close relationship with you. I'd like to get to where I just I follow you and I do right. I want to know what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God and to live that way. Lord, I want to invest in my kids. I want, I want to help them come to know you, first of all, as their Savior, and then after they have, I want to make sure that I'm giving them the best shot they have in life of getting to know you personally, so when I'm out of the picture, when I go home to glory, when I die, they can make good decisions because their relationship with you is such that they can get through this world on their own without me. I mean, there's a lot of things you could ask God for. But what she does is she says, let one sit on your right hand and the other on your left. She's self-promoting vicariously through her kids. Boy, you see a lot of that in church, don't you? Notice there's another way of self-promoting, and that's victoriously through beating everybody else down. Look at verse 20. They come to him desiring a certain thing. Notice what the Lord says. It's really interesting. He said unto her, what wilt thou? She tells him what she wants. Jesus answered, verse 22, and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? Now watch, here's what's super interesting. They say unto him, we are able. So why, that, why is that interesting? Get the picture. When you read the text, get the picture. She comes to him and asks him a question, right? He looks at her and says, what do you want? She tells him. Then in his response, he says, are ye able... He's not asking her the question because the end of this next verse says they answered him. So he obviously turned from her to the boys and he's like, you little snakes. You've been just running your yap to your mama, ain't you? You've been talking about how you guys left all and followed me and you're the sons of Zebedee and all that you're on fire for the Lord. And you've been running your mouth in the background and motivating your mama and getting your mama all worked up to get to Jesus. Mom, you ask him. Mom, you ask him. You ask him. You know the Lord has a soft spot in his heart for all the weak ones, all the smaller ones, all the kids, all the women. that I went, well, Where's dad? Dad's not in the picture. Maybe he's gone. I don't know. But mama's coming to him. You know the Lord has a soft spot for the underdog and that culture. Maybe not nowadays, but in that culture, the woman's the underdog. You know he has a soft spot for the underdog. You go ask him. By the way, he does. Did you hear me? The Lord does. He has a soft spot for the fatherless and the widows. He has a soft spot for women that are trying to serve him without a man to lead them. Whether he's spiritually a sloth at home or not in the picture, the Lord's always had a soft spot for the underdog. He don't like bullies. You go ask him, Lord. Mom, you go ask him. The Lord turns and looks at the boys. She might be trying to live vicariously, but you boys, you're trying to beat these guys down and promote yourself over your brothers. So the Lord's answer, very interesting. Can you handle it? That's verse 23, 22 and 23. They're like, oh yeah, we can handle it. The Lord's saying to him, you want to be promoted? You know what it means to be promoted? You understand what it means? <laughs> Do you even know what you're asking? Jesus Christ was not going to hand out a promotion. He wasn't going to give somebody idle the promotion they asked because they thought they deserved it. Everybody wants to be the boss except the boss. You know what it takes to be the boss? 
Do you know how many times you're home and they're already at the office and you go home at the end of the day and you just go home and complain and talk about the boss and talk about the administration and talk about how they run everything and how they don't do anything the right way and they're still at work with bigger stresses on them than you even know they have and they go home and get in bed and can't sleep because of all that's going on in their mind that they got to take care of and what they forgot and what they need to follow up on and oh my goodness and you understand what it means to make the money? You understand what it means to get the throne? You got to have the cross before you get the crown and you don't get the crown without, you don't get the cross being idle and you don't get the crown without the cross. It doesn't work any other way. And that's why socialist regimes always fail. Because it doesn't work. Lord says, oh, you want it? Okay. You think you've got what it takes? Okay. You boys are idle, and you're missing the point of what it means to serve me. You're missing the point of what I'm doing because you think you should be somewhere you're not. You know how much of my Christian life, and it's hard, I mean, I probably should preach this to preachers, but forgive me a minute. How much of my pastoring life, I missed what God was trying to show me because I thought the church should be bigger than it was. Just, just, revving the engine, revving the engine, revving the engine, revving, we're going to get something done for God. And I'm just revving the engine and not going anywhere. Why? Because I'm trying to drive success from a worldly perspective, and God had to just sit there and say Keep stomping on it. You're just going to run out of gas. Because you're missing the point, boy. Why? Because you're conceited in thinking you're more than you are. There's the conceit of selfishness and laziness and idleness and self-righteousness, but there's also the conceit of self-promotion. Makes you idle. Notice on the other end of the spectrum. So you got these guys who want to be something big and something important, but notice everybody else that was there also winds up getting rebuked by the Lord. So not everybody's trying to self-promote, but let me say this, if you're a self-promoter, everybody else who isn't can't stand you. Do I need to say that again, or does that make sense? When you're a self-promoter, everybody else who isn't a self-promoter cannot stand you. You disdain them. I find it very interesting to go to the gym, and I look at the young guys, you can call them kids because they're young enough to be my son. And, and they're standing there. And there's one guy in particular. He likes to make faces even. He forgets. I'm sitting there thinking, does he realize we're in a public place and there's other people in the room? <laughs> <laughs> makes faces at himself in the mirror. So in tune with himself. It's like obnoxious. The other guys my age look at me and we just roll our eyes and laugh and like, I don't say nothing. You know what everybody else is doing? This guy is so obsessed with himself. I always think when I see him, of course he doesn't have a girlfriend. No woman wants a man who loves himself more than he loves her. No woman wants a man who's too busy staring at himself to stare at her. Everybody that's not that guy is just as guilty on the other side of disdaining that guy. Because I've asked myself, like, why do I even care? He's just a kid. Right? Why, 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 would that even, why would I even bother myself with disdaining him? He's just a kid. He probably needs a dad. I know he needs to get his nose broke. Somebody needs to rough him up a little bit. I'd help him out a lot. I mean, really, that's good for you. You know what I mean? Just not saying, I'm not saying violence. I'm saying in a proper setting, in a sportsmanlike conduct, when the bell goes off and you <laughs> hands like. But on the other side, the ones that aren't self-promoting really get aggravated with the one who is. And you're trying to serve God the right way, humbly, and just do your part and come to church. And somebody's always encroaching on your spot. Somebody's always trying to be the next whatever. And now all of a sudden, you're not just serving God anymore. You're not just there just doing your thing and trying to be faithful to God. You're all of a sudden aggravated because they, what did they ask Jesus? Who do they think they are? They want to be my boss. And the Lord actually calls them out in the exact same setting as the guy trying to promote himself, because on both sides of the equation, it's self that's the center of the situation. Notice what I'm saying. Look down at verse number 24. When the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two. It's what I already talked about. The illustration is the young guy who's in love with himself. 
verse 25, But Jesus called them unto him and said unto them, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, you want to be somebody? Let him be your minister. Whosoever will be chief among you, he's the boss. Let him be your servant. Even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. They're obsessed with them trying to get the spot. The Lord tells them, you don't even know what you're asking. We'll see if you have what it takes. And then when we get there, I can't even tell you what's going to happen because he's put your payment in his power. And he looks over at the other guys and he says, hey, relax. Let it go. Why are you all worked up? You guys... I'll tell you what you guys can do. You guys that hate the guys that are self-promoting, why don't you go serve them? Why don't you go minister to them? They'll boss you around, but just go be a servant. Show that you're truly great and humble yourself and just go serve them. No, I'm going to serve the Lord, but I'm not serving them. You're idle. Ain't that tough. I was walking through here this week, nobody's in the building, and there's a rapper laying on the floor. <laughs> and I felt like the Lord told me, go back and pick up the rapper. He said, that's weird. I don't think so. I'm, I'm here to study. I'm the pastor. I got more calls to make. I got some, I got appointments. I got Pick up the rapper. <laughs> walking by, see rappers laying in the pew. Go in there and pick up the rappers. You say, who sits here? And your mind starts thinking, who's not cleaning up after their kids? And the Lord says, don't even think about it. Just pick up the wrappers. Because you remember when your kids were little. No, we never did that. <laughs> Are you joking? You know how many times it was absolute war for grace and she was a one-man army all by herself fighting four kids while I was up here? Our entire, almost our entire marriage, almost our entire life, Anna was two when I started the church. She's had to raise the kids, teach them to sit by themselves in church, take them out for their little come-to-Jesus meetings and bring them back in by herself. So there were some Sundays when she said to me, I don't even know why I even go to church. <gasps> the pastor's wife. <gasps> Just as human as you are. And you said the same thing. She said, I don't even know why I was there because I got nothing out of it. And I'd say, honey, you're there to be an example to the rest of the church and to teach the kids to sit still in church. Yeah, but I get nothing out of it. I'm so wore out with these stinking kids and you're up there preaching and I got to deal with these kids. And you know how many times we just get them in the car? Was the pew clean? Who cares? Don't have any idea. We're trying to hold it together, man. We're keeping the church face. Okay, yes, nice. Have a nice day. <laughs> you got a kid. Yeah. Honey, later. Honey, later. What do you mean later? I got to deal with it. Shut up. I'm not ready to. Hey, how are you? Oh, good to see you. Amen. God says just pick up the wrappers. Why? Well, you, you appreciate having a pulpit to preach in, don't you? You like it that people call you pastor and entrust you with allowing you to be their pastor, don't you? Yeah. So pick up rappers. What is that? Dad, you, you, you want to be the boss? It starts with being the servant. It starts with the cleaning schedule. It starts with the toilets. It starts with wiping the tables after. That's why the youth group's been doing it lately. Why? Well, everybody's giving them money and trying to help them get to camp. The least they can do is clean up after you when you eat. Trying to teach them something. My last point, and we'll go home or go downstairs to eat. I want you to see a reason not to be idle is because of the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 30, it says, Behold, two men sat by the wayside, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? And they say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. You know why you and I should not be idle? Because we serve a compassionate Savior. 
There are blind people out there that don't know the Lord, and, and everybody else, everybody else is, is shutting them down because they're obnoxious. Oh, they're so loud. Oh, they don't know how to behave right in church. They're just, oh my goodness, they're just, they're, did you hear what they said? Yeah the, yeah, the blind people are obnoxious. People that don't know the gospel, they can be obnoxious. Their behavior's wrong. They think it's all about them. They throw a fit in the car line. They throw a fit at the grocery store line. They throw a fit everywhere they go. They cut you off and flip you off on the highway, excuse me. That's just reality, right? We're good? Yes, that's, that's people that don't know the Lord. They're obnoxious. You know what the Lord does? He cares about them. Yes. He realizes that they can't see. He realizes that they don't get it. And I'm telling you, we got to get a hold of this in the 11th hour because the Lord's fixing to come back pretty soon, and we better get a hold of this in the 11th hour. They're being taught from a very, very early age that there is no absolute truth. You might be a girl, you might be a boy. Whatever you think you are. You ought to talk about messing with their head. You talk about child abuse. You talk about messing with somebody. They're messing with them, and they're being raised that way. And if you want to reach any of them, you better understand they're blind. God still cares about them. And you and I ought to care about them. Yeah, they're obnoxious. Yeah, they get rebuked by everybody. Shut up and leave them alone. Shut up and leave them alone. He's like, my word, man, what is wrong with you guys? He's tired. He's been working all day. Really? If somebody really wants some help, that's what I live for. Hey, what do you guys want? Lord, all we want is we want to see you. And his heart just melts. He understands the cry of their heart. He understood what they wanted, and then he gives them what they're asking for. They wanted to see. Man, if somebody wants to see the truth of the gospel, God will give it to them. If you die and go to hell, it's because you chose to die and go to hell. Well, how can you say that? I'll tell you right now how I can say that. If you don't know for sure you're saved, I give you, you give me 10 minutes in the office with a Bible, and I can show you directly from a Bible what it means to be saved, and you can know before you leave here today that you're on your way to heaven. Amen. And I, you, well, you spit and you yell. Not, no, ask a bunch of the people in this room. Not when you're in my office. I'm a pastor. Right now I'm preaching. Yes. I'm also a pastor. Yes. And that's a, that's a different thing. They go together, but there's a different approach to that. You've got to understand that. He wants you to see. But the beautiful thing is the Lord doesn't just have compassion on the blind. He had compassion on all those idle people. The guy that got there the first hour didn't. But the Lord had compassion on people that jumped in at the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and the eleventh hour. You know what he said? I don't care. I'm just glad they got in. Ain't that a blessing? You know how many people get in late and then they beat themselves up and they go, oh, I just don't know if I'm going to have any rewards when I get to heaven. And you got to understand that when somebody at 50 years old or 60 years old or 40 years old says, you know what, I've been wrong my whole life and I'm going to change. You understand what that means to God? It's one thing to change when you're a kid or when you're in your 20s or you're in your 30s and you're young, but the older you get, even into the 30s it starts getting hard. The older you get, the harder it is to change. So when God sees a man who will change that or a woman who will change that late in life, he says, I'm going to reward them just like they started at the beginning. Reagan, they haven't had all the benefit you've had growing up in church. You got it paid forward, man. God has compassion on the idol. But God also had compassion on the disciples. Ain't that a, I preach hard at you because you're saved and you can take it. But can I tell you, God has compassion on you and me. He knows that we're just flesh. He remembers our frame. He knows that we're but dust. And here they are with their motives wrong. Lord, can I sit? Can I reign? What are they doing? And the Lord's like, listen, wait a second, guys. I got something to tell you. I want to close with verses 17 through 19. I want you to see this. Jesus is going up to Jerusalem, right? He took the 12 disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the chief priests and to the scribes, and shall condemn him to death, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. While they're en route, they're going up to Jerusalem. The next chapter is the triumphal entry. They're en route going up to Jerusalem. He says, hey guys, come here a second. I want to tell you something. And he lets the disciples on in a little inside scoop. You know what that reminds me of? 
church on Sunday morning. You know, you're in the way, you're serving God, it's the 11th hour, Jesus Christ is coming back. The next ch chapter is the triumphal entry where he enters Jerusalem. You know, he's coming back to get us out of here, and then seven years after that, he's coming back to re-enter Jerusalem again. Right. We're getting close. And he says, hey, fellas, I want to talk to you. You want to not be idle in your Christian life? Then learn to never miss those moments. While they're in the way, he says, come apart for a second, and I want to give you guys an inside scoop on something. And I'm here to tell you this morning, folks, we got the inside scoop. I'm telling you, you when you look at the news and you see all that's going on in the world, you see things because you know your Bible that the rest of this world doesn't see. You got a privilege. You got a compassionate Savior who understands your struggles and understands your issues and understands all that you've done wrong and all your idleness and all your false motives and all the things where you shouldn't have done it that way and should have done it another way and you got annoyed with the blind man and whatever else it was, he sees all that and he still has compassion on you. You ought not be idle for Jesus Christ because he is coming back. He's going to be back any day now. I hope and pray it's this year, but if it's not this year, it ain't long till Jesus is coming back to get us out of here and by the grace of God. I don't want to be idle when he shows up. I want to be working in that field, pushing it to the limit. I want to go out on my shield or go out in the rapture. But I don't want to quit. Amen. I don't want to be idle. Why? Because he's coming to get you. And if he doesn't rapture us out, I want to go out with my combat boots on, on my shield, carry it out knowing that I finished all the way for my Savior, but I wasn't idle. Let's stand to our feet this morning with our heads bowed and eyes closed. As the piano player comes, I just want to give you an opportunity. Get in there for the Lord. Maybe the Lord showed you something this morning where you've been in idle. You've been kind of sitting in neutral. You're, you've been pushing the gas, but you're not getting anywhere. Well, the idleness got to stop. Do what you do for Him because you love Him. Ask Him to pull you aside and show you some things. He will. I promise you He will. There's never been a soul that cried out to God and didn't find God there. Not when it's genuine. Not when it really wants going. It's not time to be idle.